John. Hi, Tarush. Uh, great to see you. And I think uh, if you looked at the earlier uh, presentations in this track, uh, you 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 recognise that we've got. Um, it's all led up to up to your presentation because oh. after seeing how people have have gained uh, value from uh, different types of products and services that exposed through APIs, they're really thinking, well, how do I do this with data? And yes. uh, so they're they're really primed for for you to to share your your insights. Awesome. I'm just about to request my. I'm just about to share my screen. Okay. And um, I'll be done in about twenty minutes. So I'll see you on stage for the Q and A. Okay, I'll just wait here till your screen is up. Okay, it's it's loading. All good. It's all good. Uh, awesome. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tarish. I'm super excited to chat about data reporting and analytics on top of APIs. I know I'm the last talk in the segment, and I know it's been a long segment. So let's take a moment to stretch. I know I can't see you, but trust me, you should take a moment to take a few deep breaths in. All right. So let's get right into it. I know I saw this on the previous slide, but how many people over here have heard that the most precious, the most precious resource is no longer oil, but data? And this was uh, a super famous article written by The Economist in 2018. It's been three years since that article, but still 90% of companies today are growing despite data, not because of it. So what this means for you is that there's a golden opportunity. If you leverage data today, you can use it as a golden opportunity, as a competitive advantage. So investing in data allows you to do a few things. It allows you to discover insights into your data, which other companies are going to miss on. And it also allows you to figure out how are your customers actually using your APIs. So I'm going to tell you exactly how to use leverage, how to leverage data as a competitive advantage. But before that, I want to share a story with you. So for those PC versus Mac fans, pay attention. Um, so my story is, for the last few years, Apple has been working on a new processor. So Apple just recently launched a new processor, which is the M1 chip. And this chip is you know, a real state-of-the-art chip. Uh, it's a giant leap forward in computer processors. And this chip, when it was introduced, for the first time, it allowed battery life between 15 to 20 hours, something completely unheard of for laptops. It had more compute. It had more processing power than any of its Intel counterparts. And when this chip came out, uh, obviously, this was a huge win for Apple. What's really interesting is that a few weeks ago, Intel fought back. And what Intel did is under, under certain uh, conditions, Intel proved that its chip is actually better than the Apple M1 under, under certain conditions. So they were able to find these conditions and then, share an, and then share some findings of how the Intel chip actually wins. Now, while this is technically true, under these scenarios, the Intel chip is faster. This doesn't tell the entire story. The entire story, it's very clear that the Apple M1 chip is just a superior chip. So the reason I share this story is that whenever you deal with data, you're always going to find that you can always construe the data to make your story look good. And this is probably, if you take anything away from my talk, this is the most important lesson, that if you're looking to prove something with data, you're always going to be able to do that. And your data team is really, really good at being able to prove anything which you want them to prove. So what that means is, before any analysis, I want you to ask yourself, are you using data to learn from? 
or for this analysis, are you using data to prove something? Now, there's nothing wrong with using data to prove something. You have to do that all the time. But if you find that you're using data to prove all the time, then you're really missing out on the massive opportunity to use data to learn. And one of the reasons why those 90% of companies really are not are growing despite data, not because of it, is they're not structured in a way to use data to learn. So with that, let's get into how we actually do this. We're gonna talk about how do we leverage data on top of APIs. A little bit about myself. I've worked in data for the last 10 years. I started off as the first data engineer on the analytics team at Salesforce. Uh, most recently, I ran data for WeWork, uh, where I helped scale the data team from two to 100 plus, as WeWork opened hundreds and hundreds of locations in over 120 cities in, in, in 23 plus countries. I know we have a location in Jakarta, so if anyone's uh, is if anyone's joining us from Jakarta, how's it going? Hello. Um, so let's talk about those 90% of companies which are unable to use data correctly. Let's see what's happening over there. So why aren't companies able to leverage data correctly? Well, number one, data hires are expensive and difficult to hire. And as we said before, a lot of companies are spending more time proving and not enough time learning from data. And if any of you happen to be in one of those companies, you know that prioritization based on who screams the loudest means that the data team is spending 80% of its time on mundane tasks instead of on tasks which move the needle forward. And very often decision-making is actually bottlenecked by analytics instead of being supported by analytics. So if you look at a pyramid, most companies spend their time on insights and analytics. And that makes obvious sense. That's where the value for the companies come from. But if you spend your time on insights and analytics without having a data foundation, that's like trying to build a skyscraper without digging up the earth. So everyone knows that if you wanna build an iconic skyscraper, the first thing you have to do is build a foundational layer. If you don't do that, then it's gonna take you much, much longer to add layers. And more importantly, it can all come crashing down. So in that same way, insights and analytics make sense to focus on, but if you do it without the foundation, it's a recipe for disaster. It's not gonna scale. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna cover today is how do you actually build this foundational layer, which then allows you to focus on the analytics and insights later on. So, when thinking about designing a, a foundation for your data systems, there are two main types of systems. One of them are the transactional systems, which we call OLTP. And a lot of this conference has focused on these systems. These are really designed for your application. So they're consistent systems, meaning that anytime a transaction happens, the database is now consistent. So an example is if you withdraw money from a bank, as soon as that transaction is over, your bank balance will reflect the new updated balance. And these type of systems are built to read and modify data. Now, when thinking about analytics, we want to introduce a second system into the mix. So we introduce analytical systems, which are what we call OLAP systems. And these systems are built for reporting. They are not consistent immediately, they're what we call eventually consistent. So instead of being immediately consistent, they're more optimized for analytics, for joins, for reports, and for aggregating large amounts of data, which allow you, allow you to get a bird's eye view of what's happening. And these systems by design are only read access. They should not ever be allowed to modify data. Re sort of data reporting is built on this assumption that you're reading data. A lot of people ask me, can you design reporting on top of a transactional system? Or some companies start to build reportings of their production databases. Now, you can do that, but it's not designed to do that. Think of it like making a PowerPoint presentation on your iPhone. It's technically possible you could do it, 
But again, your laptop is much better suited to build a presentation and your phone can be used to view it. So in that same way, you want to have, you want to separate out your transactional systems and your analytical systems. This is going to save you a lot of headache later on. Next, once we decide we're going to build a new OLAP system, the first thing we need to figure out is how are we going to move our data from all of our transactional systems or our data sources inside a data warehouse, which is typically the standard OLAP data storage layer. So where majority of, of companies today spend their time is building pipelines. This is what majority of data teams spend their time doing, building pipelines between their production systems and their reporting systems. And the, what they follow is this type of a transformation called ELT, where you extract your data from your source systems, you then transform it in a way to answer questions and then load it into your data warehouse. Now, this is a very old construct in doing things. What instead we want to move to, towards is ELT, where we load our data as raw data from our source systems into our warehouse, and then we can do the transforms later. So the big reason we wanna move from ETL to ELT is when we move to ELT, we can separate out the EL and T step and we can completely automate EL. So we can use tools to automate extracting data from the source systems and putting it into our warehouse. And this alone is going to give you the biggest ROI in being a lot more efficient than majority of teams out there. So at the end of this step, we have now extracted our data and put it inside our data warehouse. Well, the next step is once we have this raw data, how do we answer questions from it? So what a lot of the companies right now are doing are they built analysis directly on top of the raw data. And what happens with this is the raw data was really structured for your application. It was structured for your application or for your ads or for your marketing. It wasn't structured in a way to answer questions. So what this means is that your raw data can change at any time as your application changes. So if you build analysis directly on top of your raw data, what's gonna happen is that your analysis are prone to breaking when your raw data changes. The second thing which happens is, as you go on and as you build more and more analysis, now, as, now let's say you wanna change one of your metrics. That, Let's say you change your definition of a daily active user or LTV of a customer. Now, when you change one metric, you have to go change all the analysis which refer to that metric. So you have what you call a massive fan out problem. And all of this is happening because you're going to the raw data for every new analysis. Now, instead over here, what we're going to do is we're gonna work backwards from the business we want to try and figure out what are the questions we're trying to answer? What are the questions sales is trying to answer? Sales is trying to figure out how many, how many items were sold. Marketing is trying to figure out how effective was your last campaign? How many users did it bring? What's the LTV of the user? How much can we spend on advertising? What your product team is trying to figure out is how are customers using our, using our product? Uh, what parts of our app are well used, what parts are not used, which parts can we optimize. So each department has got a certain number of questions they're trying to answer. The goal when designing a business layer is, how do we create a data model which is actually optimized at answering these questions? Unlike the raw data, which is optimized at answering questions for your application. It's not optimized for reporting, it's optimized for your application. We wanna create a new layer which is optimized for reporting. And now every analysis is gonna be built on top of this layer, which means that every if we change a metric, we only need to change it one time in the design of the data layer and not every time we do an analysis on top of that new business layer. So this is the second thing we're going to do when we design our analytical systems. The third thing is, once we have a clean business layer, we wanna set up a BI tool or a business intelligence tool, 
which helps us answer 80% of questions. Now, what that means is folks from sales, marketing, product, when they have these questions, instead of depending on the data team, if they can go into a tool and answer questions for themselves, what we have shown is that companies that can answer 80% of questions self-service. What that means is if your intern who joins tomorrow can come and answer some really complicated question about your campaigns or about your product or about your sales pipeline, then two things happen. Number one is that employees are empowered and have autonomy to make decisions. So a lot of people have heard of this idea of failing fast. Failing fast as a business. Failing fast is predicated upon, em upon employees being able to come up with their own hypothesis and then I trade on these uh, hypotheses and update their thinking. So you can only fail fast if your employees are empowered to make their own decisions. And they can only, they can only do that if they can answer questions for themselves. So answering 80% of questions self-service is gonna allow you to move a lot quicker because now people don't depend on the data team, they can answer questions for themselves. And the second thing this is gonna do for you is your data team is now going to have time to focus on the needle moving work. They're gonna have time focused on discovering gold in your data. And since they're not answering ad hoc questions for the business, they're also gonna have the capacity to execute this needle moving work. So this is a game changer in giving your employees more autonomy and then also being able to discover stuff in your data, which other companies will miss. So to put it all together, when, when designing an analytical system on top of your APIs, there are three main steps. First is how do you ingest your data from your transactional systems into your warehouse? The second is designing a business layer, which is built by, by working backwards from figuring out what are the type of questions you wanna answer and designing a layer which is optimized for answering those questions. And the third is self-service BI reporting which allows you to answer 80% of your questions in a self-service manner. So to summarize the talk, we learned a few lessons. Our first lesson, which is the most important, is you can always construe your data to make your story look good. This is what data teams are really, really good at. So before any analysis, ask yourself, are you using data to learn something or are you using data to prove something? And if the answer is prove too many times, you know you're missing out on the real power of data. Lesson number two, trying to invest in data without having an infrastructure is like trying to build a skyscraper without digging up the earth. You can do it in the medium term. It's going to not scale. And worst case scenario, everything is gonna to come toppling down, which is a really, really bad place to be. So instead, spending time building infrastructure and then focusing on insights and analytics is a lot, is a more scalable way to grow. It's more pyramid shaped than inverse pyramid shaped. Lesson three, transactional and reporting systems are separate and they should be separated. You can do it together, but it's gonna cause you headaches later on. They both are optimized for different use cases and they should be separated out. Lesson four, moving from ETL to ELT is the lowest hanging fruit. It allows you to separate out EL from T, which allows you to fully automate EL. And in 2020, this one tactic had the had the highest ROI for data teams. So it's one you should really pay attention to. Lesson five, raw data is designed for source systems. So you want to have an additional layer called the business layer, which we design by working backwards, figuring out what are the questions the business is trying to answer and designing a data model for those questions. And finally, lesson six, Companies that can answer 80% of questions in a self-service manner are far faster at building products and are also likely to discover gold in the data, something which other companies would miss out on. 
why now everyone a lot of people think that data is only important when you become bigger and there are few reasons why that's not correct and why you should focus on data today number 1 we spoke about this at the very beginning is that 90% of companies are doing this wrong so there's an opportunity right now where if you leverage data correctly you can use this as a competitive advantage none of your competition would be doing this and you can use this to grow faster number 2 is if you're serious about scaling your business you are going to need to do this anyway at some point if you don't have these systems everything will stop and that's why companies hit this plateau so if you know you're going to get there it's much more efficient cheaper and helps you grow if you do this now when you're smaller and you have the right fundamentals and foundation to help you scale as the business grows and number 3 now that you know how to do this and we've spoken about the six tactics you can use to go build these analytical systems is it efficient to be focusing on ad hoc reports or using hunches anymore when you know how to actually design and build analytical systems so don't be like 90% of companies the picture to your left is how 90% of companies are structured where the data teams are the ones who answer questions for the business and what this means is that as the business scales and as you add more people you need to add additional heads to scale uh, to answer questions for the business and this itself is a full time job so the data team doesn't get to do high value work which is where a lot of the roi comes from on the other hand focusing on building a self service business layer allows you allows the data team to focus on high value work while at the same time allows the business to answer questions and move faster so it's a win win scenario if any of this is interesting uh we have a program at 5x data which teaches companies exactly how to do this so we teach you how to build these data fun these data foundations from scratch um and we give you the instructions best practices support and everything else you need to go do this so you have everything you, you now understand everything you need to do this yourself if you're interested in accelerating your timeline towards data driven a program might be right for you so feel free to reach out here are my details feel free to take a picture of this uh we have a few minutes for q and a um but you know follow me on instagram follow me on linkedin i share a lot of content out there you have my email address as well as my whatsapp thank you so much uh and we can we can get yeah. to questions thanks very much tarish a lot of great um a lot of great insights and best practices there for for building a data capability um we we did have a a question um uh, and about this ETL to ELT transition yeah. and i know that you talked about it uh, and you mentioned things like uh performance um but can you just sort of elaborate a little bit about why um why ETL is is lower and more cumbersome than yeah. um than uh ELT sure so etl was was around since the 80s and the main idea behind etl was that storage was not cheap so you had a copy of your data inside your transactional systems and when you wanted to move it to your reporting systems you didn't want to move the entire data you wanted to transform it so that you could only move the data so you could only move the analysis so you would perform the transformation come up with the output and then move the output into a data warehouse since you already had the copy inside the transactional systems now what's happened in the last 10 years is that is that storage has become really really cheap so the advantage of having a a copy of your data inside your data warehouse as well as your transactional system means that you can now choose to do, do your transforms later on and on the fly so along with storage becoming cheap 
performance of warehouses has also increased dramatically. So a lot of these transformations don't have to be pre-computed. Modern BI tools can run these transformations on the fly. So you have a copy of the raw data. You then create a separate layer, which is modeled. And that layer can either be pre-computed or the times when you can have your business layer also as a live layer on top of your raw data. And then all the analysis can be done later on the fly. So that's, that, 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 that's um, I, I understand that. And uh, I think that's a great, great explanation uh, for sure. how uh, ETL evolved and how um, and, and the reasons, the drivers for moving to, to, to ELT. But there is another question that I think leads on from that is that mm -hmm. sometimes with um, uh, time critical data, it's yeah. important to process data as soon as it um, uh, appears. And, and so maybe you need um, under some circumstances you want to um, process data as soon as it's available rather than send it to a data warehouse and then then crunch it. So how, how do you see, see that? Um, yeah. Um, so I think what you're referring to is this idea of being able to process data in real time, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea from a reporting perspective and from an analytical perspective, the very few use cases from a reporting perspective where data needs to be processed in, let's say, a minute or sub minute, right? They, they do exist. In that case, the data warehouse might not be the right architecture for you. So in that case, moving to something like Kafka with stream processing on top, where you can in real time act on an event and then use to update some sort of key value store. So you have real time analytics for something like stream processing or an example use case is something like Netflix when they want to in real time know the performance of their streams and of their video loaders. In that case, sub second performance is needed. In that case, you don't have time to move to an OLAP system. Like I mentioned earlier with OLAP systems, these are not immediately consistent. They're eventually consistent. So they don't, they don't guarantee real-time performance. So in that paradigm, it's not the right architecture. However, when, for like 99.9% .9 of analytical use cases, you don't have sub-minute um, you don't have sub you don't have a sub minute constraint on reporting time great th th thanks very much for for illustrating the, those two uh, the, the, those two methods sure. and uh, and the drivers for them so um, really appreciate the uh, the insights you you've created you've shared and and the lessons uh, from from that and uh, yes as Terry says uh, feel free to uh, to get in contact uh, with him and uh, this this concludes our uh, connected products track. Uh, we're going to take. Uh, uh, thank, thanks very much, uh, Tarush.